4,000 meter elevation. What is Bardandesia? It's a member of the Moutizier in the Asteracee, like oh. a small Moutizia. Beautiful. But terribly spiny. Typical of these altitudes. All of these are the highland peat swamps. Here the peat is not due to the sphagnum, to the mosses, same as in Europe for instance, but due to many different angiosperms, especially among the Jancassae Gen family, and especially the Distichia. And you can see some uh, tuft from here very closely. It's a Distichia, but there are many other species. And uh, we should ask to Cecil Ostria because she did make a thesis of PhD on these high altitude swamps in Bolivia. It's uh, very similar here. The probably altitude here is around 4,300, 4,400 meters. Very cold, you see some patches of ice. Um, and also some, some aquatic plants inside, maybe some Liliopsis, something like that. Here, among the aquatic plants, we see a very strange one, Liliopsis, member of the Apiaceae. Very strange because it has totally articulated leaves. We see here in the water. I'll take, we see the perfectly articulate leaves of the Liliopsis. C'est incroyable, l'Iliopsis.
we see tiny blue flowers. Maybe it belongs to the family Gentianaceae. Maybe I have to check a few millimeters in diameter. And here we understand all these two socks are made of the distichia. So we see these plants are creating the pit. So we see they are growing from the tip. The last leaves are living. Perfectly distichus, hence the name distichia. The Jacaginaceae family. We see them totally oppressed together, creating these very spiny cushions with decaying progressively, create the pit at the base. Yes, I put my handkerchief because it's uh, very, very sunny at more than 4,000 meters above sea level. Every night the temperature is freezing, of course, minus two, minus three, sometimes up to minus five. And uh, we see, even now it's almost 10 o'clock in the morning, we see the ice <coughs> not yet melted of the last night. In this kind of a landslide along the river, we see the very deep amount of peat, the dark brown peat, which is also used to, as combustible by the people living in these very high Andes. Yes, I did lose my handkerchief, did fly away in the cold water, I cannot recuperate it. I'm very, very sad because handkerchief is so important for me. These tiny few millimeter long plicate leaves are probably leaves of Lachemilla among the rosaceae, not to be confused with Alchemilla. There are also some Alchemilla, but this is Lachemilla and it is typical of these highland peat swamps. We see the tiny, tiny leaf plicate. Cushions or so. not the lost world of the Carboniferous era, the primary era. Yes, I am among these giant hostels, genus Equisetum, one of the biggest species of the world. We see it can reach about four meters high. It has all the lateral ramification. And actually, they, uh, they look a little bit like the giant uh, uh, calamites and uh, other hostels for Carboniferous era. And we see the diameter, the new young shoots, um, lateral shoots, and here we see also bigger individuals. 
Only in South America are remaining two species of this giant equisetum. It's uh, always growing in water. We see emerging from the soil like this. We see the young shoots here among the Veronia. Young shoots emerging and finally this forest of calamitous-like, carboniferous-like plants. But they were much bigger in the Carboniferous era. Instead of being four or five meters tall, they were about uh, 25, 30 meters tall. And woody, these ones are not woody. It's why they don't give carbon. Bon, on aurait pu prendre plus de temps sur la route. Mais... En tout cas, c'est pas du tout 8 heures. Mais... Non, c'est 10 heures. We can see just was what is remaining from the last houses because already four houses have fallen in the water uh, in the Madre de Dios during the high water season and uh, all the banks are totally eroded and trees are falling and houses are falling because sometimes millimeters each year are destroyed on the bombs. So cage, so beautiful. Pakistakis coccinea. And uh, another red flower, inflorescence, an heliconia. I don't know which species, there are so many heliconias. One of the philodendron of the subgenus Meconostigma. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Meconostigma philodendrons are always big, they have always big trunks, short internodes, and always these spiny roots. This one is philodendron solimoessense, and we know also, for instance, philodendron guldi. As the name suggests, it is common in all Amazonia. The Anturium clavigerum, very, very typical leaves, digitate, and uh, it's uh, strange because this species uh, is common in, uh, in coast, from Costa Rica to to South America. It has a very wide distribution, both central and tropical America. It's not at all usual for other Anturium species. One of the smallest plants of this forest is a tiny peperomia, and we see it's adult because we see the spadix here, erect, and we see the very small upressed leaves, and so it's a good way uh, during the long dry season to avoid desiccation because the tiny leaves, shingle leaves, are totally upressed to the bark. 
That was quite a bit down there, you know. The, uh, This is a Fitonia albivenis, the new name because uh, before it was known as Fitonia Ferskafelti, but the uh, correct name is albivenis. It's a strand because this one actually has uh, pink nerves because there are two forms of this species in nature. Right? So, uh, when uh, some, some people see them in, uh, in nursery, they think it's a uh, selection, but no, here we see in nature there are also the form with the red nerves red vines and it's usually growing on decaying wood. Here it's not decaying, it's the base of a, of a tree, but very close to the ground, it's creeping because it cannot grow directly on the ground because it should be covered by leaf litter. So it's always growing just above the ground, either on decaying logs or at the base of trunks like this. It's common, but difficult to see. <laughs> Maybe yeah. common. How is possible to see? How, How you did see? You jump in. Ah, jumping, okay. The visage is where? The visage is devant. It's the two jambes derrière. Elle a des cornes, peu, tu vois, devant. Very big one. This is a small shrub, very common in the uh, Amazonian forests, and it's a Potalia amara, member of, a, of the Loganiaceae. Hmm. Very bright axis of inflorescence. Same as in many Rubiaceae, Melastomataceae. All the axes are colorful and flowers quite small. Bien les voir dans la nature. Ah. 
Are you call in uh, Spanish, Mauricia? No, we call aguaje. Aguaje. Elle a des pattes rouges sublimes, la poule d'eau. Nafea open at uh, just at, after sunset? Yes, after sunset. But there are some, some already trying to open look in the middle. Yes, 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 I see that. Yes. <laughs> Incroyable. We see a very beautiful population of Geogenanthus pepegi. It's a plant of, uh, it's a member of the Comelinaceae, member of the uh, wandering Jew family, like Tradescancia, Comelina, etc. Eric stem has only three or four leaves and it is totally adapted to the shade. We see the very dark green leaves. We see also this very usual under surface of the leaves, which is totally purplish. Even if we don't know why these anthocyanes are accumulated, because before we were thinking it was a kind of reflection of the light to collect all the photons from the flux of light, but it seems actually it's not the result. Maybe also it could be useful in uh, case of a very low amount of nutrients because anthocyanins can revert to some sugars. The upper surface, so it's dark green. Dark green is, you, is uh, due to accumulation of uh, chlorophyll in the chloroplast. But also the white silvery markings, it's more difficult to understand the adaptation of these white silver markings, which are very, very common in industrial plants. Maybe it's a reserve of gas, maybe, uh, for instance, oxygen during early uh, morning, or when light in the morning is arriving, it could be accumulation in the cell, epidermal cells, of carbon dioxide useful for photosynthesis. So I'm very careful to live without damaging any of this plant. C'est bien sterculiacé la fleur.
très méchante, cette famille-là. Et le dar, il est au bout de l'abdomen ah, Oui, ben, tu vois, on, on voit. On voit. Ah, oui. ah oui, on voit. Mais la stomata C, myrmecophilus, I mean, with a tight relation with ants, but for the Mayeta stococars, it's a pouch is in the leaves, but here it's not really close pouch, it's simply the basal part of the blade, there is an empty space in the middle. Here there are no ants, but we see these two parts create a chamber, we see Everything is ready for the pouch. It's extraordinary. It's very, very beautiful, this colibri. Yeah. The colibri must be happy. Yeah. It's a small palm, which seems to be a geonoma. You see the infrutescence here, with red fruit and finally black fruit. And it's very important because all the wolves, uh, it's, uh, use, it's uh, used to thatch, for thatching, to cover the wolves. And we see uh, where we are living, in Caterra Lodge. We see that uh, all the roofs are covered with it and it's very, very efficient when it's raining a lot, just as we had this morning a lot of rain and it's absolutely perfect for that. It is common in terra firme forests. excretion of water through the hydratodes along the leaf margin is a common phenomenon in understory during the night and early morning. Probably it acts like a kind of kidney for the plants, I mean uh, eliminating some excess of minerals, which should, because it's not windy in forest, so very low rate of transpiration, so this is a kind of flux in the plant provoked by this hydratodes. One of the so many species of piper, and so the piper, family piperaceae, so we use piper nigrum for the pepper, but uh, all together there are more than 1,000 species of piper and in Peru only, I think if I remember, there are about 200 different species, mostly in the lowland rainforest, but also at forest edges at uh, mid elevation up to 2,500, 3,000 meters elevation. But the high diversity of piper is as shrubby species, just few meters high in the forest understory. It is the young stage of one of the most common palms. It's either Iriartea deltoidea or Socratea exoriza. It's very difficult to distinguish both species at this stage, but it has later, when adult, both species have stilt roots. Fishtail palm. Similar to in Asia to the tribe of Arenga.
What is this? It's very strange, the small balls. The small balls actually are on the end potatoes and many, many different varieties. Uh, it's just, most are small varieties, some are tiny, tiny small thing on the dry, the dry them in sun during the dry season. At almost 4,000 meters above sea level. The genus Calceolaria is really incredible. We see some species growing under flowing water, and we see some other species with tiny, like thymus leaves, totally adapted to very dry areas because this is a rock uh, cliff, eh? and uh, the plant, this Calceolaria, is growing just inside, so totally exposed to kind of desert plant species. So very few genera actually are like this, according to the species, adapted either to the totally wet environment and totally dry. I was looking at what I thought was a cactus uh, open sea light, but when I approach, I, I see that actually, in spite of the very thick stems, totally green, it's not at all a cactus, it's an oxalis, and it has spiny remnants of uh, the probably stipules, but incredible, I did not know at all that uh, the oxalis could be cactus like. Small Puya species creating clumps as very usual in many Puya species, except of course the giant solitary Puya remondi. One of the most common shrubby species here are very spiny, thorny berberries. C'est hallucinant, c'est l'Iken, c'est de la neige. Ah, c'est du sel. C'est du sel 
oui. Non. C'est du sel, ça Sel. Ah, c'est du sel. C'est du sel, je crois que c'était délicat. Yes, we are in the canyon, and it's a habitat for the giant Puya Remondi, and uh, so we can uphold them. It's incredible because they look a little bit like the black bog, the Xanthorea in Australia. They look also like uh, Argyroxyphium uh, in Hawaii, uh, but uh, they are much more big than all these plants. It's the highest, uh, tallest monocarpic plant growing so high in the world because it's uh, very dense and it reaches this will go close but I think it reaches about seven or eight meters maybe ten meters like this and uh, all inflorescence by itself is at least three meters so we'll go to see it the symbol of the high Andes Puya Remondi here at about 4200 meters above sea level freezing every night Mais c'est une sculpture. We see also the spines, which are very good protection against animals. But at this altitude, the meristem, the top of the 
the apex of the growing point is totally protected by these leaves and it's very important because at night it's very often minus two, minus five, sometimes up to minus 10 degrees because we are just uh, we are about 4,100 meter elevation. So we see that this plant has very well protected apex, so protected from cold at night, protected from too much water sometimes when sometimes every rain, very unpredictable, now is a dry season and it's raining. So protected from frost, protected from rain and protected from wind also because it's uh, very dry here and protected from fire and we see that the base of the stipe of the trunk can be burned but the sheath bases of leaves protect it. It's a kind of same adaptation we can observe in the Dendro Senecio, the huge Senecio in the mountains of Africa, like Rwenzori mountain, also the giant Lobelias, also in the in these same mountains, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Rwenzori. So it's a typical adaptation of the high altitudes, but this one is much higher than all the Senecios and Lobelias I have seen in Mountains of Africa. It's uh, incredible. I could never imagine. I did see many photos of Puya Remondi. I could never imagine. I did estimate at least 13, actually more than 12, 13, maybe 15 meters high. Incredible. And at least six meters for the inflorescence itself only. the destiny of the monocarpic plants. Huge inflorescence, thousands, maybe millions of seeds here. <laughs> of course, millions of seeds and afterwards it dies. But we see regeneration is perfect because I did see some small individuals also. So it is a protected area for this Puya Remondi, of course. And uh, I'm happy to see it still alive. On the vertical cliffs, almost vertical, we see many more individuals, but all of them are small. It seems they cannot maybe reach the mature stage, maybe because there is no soil at all, and the problem with the rock, very cold at night, very hot during the day. So they are protected from fire, so it's maybe why there are so many young individuals. So the first establishment is easy, but after the growth, uh, mature growth seems much more unpredictable on these cliffs. We are looking at the puma in the puna, looking at the puya. But unfortunately, we don't see pumas, but we know they are around here.
It's a species of a Loazaceae. This family mostly uh, diversified in South America, and especially in the Andes. And we see all these hairs. We have to be very careful not to touch because very stinging hairs. We see even on the petals, petals are totally covered with these stinging hairs in the same way as the nettles. So, but uh, maybe it's a Cayophora. Inside also the flower is very beautiful. Already this type of petal cupulate like this. Some are annual species, some are perennial. This I think it's a perennial species. I think uh, each year it has new shoots. Yes, but it's not every day now. Means he is happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> happy with your wife. Lupin. The Muna. Eh? Munia. Munia. Probably, probably Lipia. Verbenacé now in Labier. Probably. Santicactus? Ah oui, c'est un petit cactus. Oui, on va les. Eh oui, oui. Neige, titi caca. Very, very pretty. Oh, the little bit. 
Linda. Ciao. Ciao. Very fern like, but it's not a fern at all. I see the old inflorescence, maybe a rosacea of the Alchemilla, like Alchemilla group. Here we see beautiful clumps of Ichu, steep Ichu. The grass, the grass of the Puna and Altiplano everywhere. And uh, of course, it's used for thatching for roofs, it's uh, used for grazing by uh, animals, uh, both uh, llama, alpaca, and now also cows <laughs> and sheep. Very much it's a natural color, this color. Yeah, yeah. natural, yeah. Know where to go. Yes, yes, yes. They started to catch them, but... Can be long or it's always very short? Very short. Ah, always. Oh, the mur is incredible. Le mur couvert de mousse, là, c'est... In camera. Small fedra growing here. Dark gray stems. These small things, probably a rosacea, lacimilla, probably. It looks also a little bit like a small euphorbia, but is it white? Oh, it's white. <laughs> it's an, a small euphorbia. Ah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a small euphorbia. A very small one. Yes, yes, tiny leaves. Tilancia totalia pressed to the rock. May say this, I don't know, too small. No, not a medium. Uh, pilobium, uh, maybe. We clearly, clearly see the small roots of this. Tilancia totally pressed to the rock. Here we see no soil at all, simply the roots fixed to the rock to maintain the plant.
We are along the shores of the Lake Titicaca at 3,800 meters above sea level. Everybody knows that it's the highest uh, navigable lake in the world. Many, many birds around us. So this lake is about 200 kilometers long and about 70 in the, in the widest part. It is very deep because the deepest part is about 270 meters. So it's a very deep lake and um, it seems it's uh, quite new, it's a quaternary lake, but uh, uh, many fish have evolved in this lake, uh, especially the genus Orestias, where there are about 20 to 25 species according to classification. And uh, many of them have, uh, populations have terribly reduced uh, due to under one species also, Orestias cuvieri is suppose, of we are sure, has disappeared, and uh, because the introduction of the truths, uh, two species of truths in the lake, of course, for people, it's easier to, to catch uh, truths uh, about this size than the Orestias, which are big like this. But it's a pity for, of course, the equilibrium of the lake. Uh, anyway, we have seen many, many interesting things, even on the road to come here, for instance, uh, the Inijani Canyon, uh, with some so beautiful uh, stones and uh, of course, uh, one of the most beautiful populations of Puya Remondii. Puya Remondii we find usually between 3,800 and 4,500 meters above sea level. And it's uh, the highest uh, monocolous and monocarpic plant. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit uh, similar to the Espeletia, but Espeletias are in the northern part, in the Colombia, mostly in Colombia, and North Ecuador, Colombia and uh, Venezuela but uh, the, the Espeletia and the Asteraceae never reach the size of the Puya Remondii because Puya Remondii, inflorescence by itself, can reach 9 to 10 meters. Now the total plant is often 12, 13, up to 15 meters tall. Of course, it's a little bit reminiscent of what we can see also in the high mountains of Africa with the Dendrocenesio and the giant Lobelia. But the Puya Remondii is the highest uh, compact inflorescence we can find. Uh, we have seen, of course, also um, in the Lake Titicaca, the islands, uh, the famous uh, Takile Islands, with the people keeping uh, very, very precise traditions. And so it's uh, very interesting. And many interesting plants also are growing on the cliffs in uh, this uh, island. And of course, the famous uh, Uros Islands, uh, the floating island, with a uh, Totora, here we see the Totora. Totora is a Xenoplectus californicus, uh, the subspecies Tatora. Tatora, not Totora, in Latin name. It's used for everything to make the boats, to, to, to create all the floating islands. Huh? Floating islands usually are about 20 to 25 meters in diameter. And uh, of course, it's a lot of work. They have to, to renovate regularly, but it's, uh, it's quite new. It's uh, since uh, about 500 years that people, uh, since um, the Spanish came here. And uh, so they live, uh, they did leave the shores of the Lake Titicaca to create this floating island. Temperature of the water, of course, is very cold, uh, usually between 8 and uh, 10 degrees. Along the shore, sometimes up to 12 or 13 degrees, but it is always very cold. So also a lot of oxygen dissolved because of the low temperatures. It's why the Orestias have evolved here. And uh, so there are beautiful landscapes uh, with uh, incredible uh, scissors, uh, kind of scissors. It, it seems it's a sandstone, red, all the sandstones. Of course, among the plants, it's a low plants, eh, but some cactus species, for instance. And as soon as there are many rocks, because we did see also a limestone cliff, and as soon as you have many small holes in the rock, of course, you have many plants growing there. But also on the bare cliff, some tilansia are perfectly thriving there. So it's a pity to see now almost only eucalypts, eh? almost eucalyptus everywhere. Uh, instead of polylepis, here there is a uh, clump of polylepis. Uh, everything has been destroyed because it's inhabited since uh, pre-Inca times. So probably the, all the landscape has been totally different since at least 1,500 years, something like that, maybe, maybe more. So we can suppose that all this should be maybe not totally covered by forest, but at least partly in the Quebradas covered by 
Polylepis forest and other uh, mixed species of Budleya and uh, also on very exposed uh, cliffs we can find the Contuta, Contua buxifolia, which is a national flower of both Peru and Bolivia. And it's uh, the Contuta, of course, it's uh, the marvel, marvel of the, of the high handies. Voilà, so now it's uh, the end of the travel from Amazonia to Lake Titicaca. So many <laughs> different landscapes and vegetation, of course. I'm waiting for the Cuscania. Ha, 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 ha.